so, my list today, um, we'll start with uh, flavor, a lot of flavor of glass that is motif based, that came up also in multiple alignments. Glass is also flavor. A lot of programs in this week possess that. Um, I'll get back faster. I started last week, but I couldn't finish it, so I'll uh, the slides in here today and I'll try and get. Hammer home the message about hashing and, and an implementation as fast a has been doing it to give you really you know a feel of how could you how could you construct such a thing. Um, then we go in homology uh, searching once again. The technology behind Blast I've done the last time. So some other extensions. Blast side Blast are doing profile, but the uh, the database is not consistent with profile, so there are flavors there. Then the most important innovation effect of last is, uh, is the statistical treatment of the data. So I'll go into some detail there. Uh, then we talk about how can you do it right, how can you do it wrong, some philosophical points. Uh, very importantly, um, the validation. So how do you know how a bit of work on this, I guess, in the last course. So I'll give you some of the theory uh, there. And, uh, well, also issues. What, what can go wrong again? Uh, one of which I will do in detail because that is combinatorial theory. How to assess whether a sequence has low complexity, has a reduced alphabet, so it's not amenable to sequence searching. And Blast is said to do that. Alright, so let's start. So, first, five Blast, it is just like Blast, but where Blast you typically have as input just a single sequence. Here as well, you have a given pattern, a motif that you think is important, that you know about, and you would like to conduct a search using BLAST while it is aware of that motif. You would like to tune in the search into also finding proper sequences that might have that motif. Uh, that is what BLAST can do. Um, so here is here's the question. Um, so it, 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 it zooms in more in searching, you know, the scoring of the motif region is a bit upweighted versus scoring the non-motif regions. That is uh, what, what it is doing. The sequence patterns, by the way, I don't know if that has come across already, if you've heard this uh, fly past already. ProSide is a database of protein motifs, and one of the ways of expressing these motifs as a regular expression, I mentioned that the last time, will be a lecture where this comes back really heavily. Uh, so it's, it's pattern-based searching, pattern-based searching. So all the, uh, the technology basically is exactly the same as the side last, only the scoring scheme is a bit stricter because, uh, of course, where the pattern is, you do not want to allow uh, other amino acids as you would do in, in other regions. Okay, so that's uh, this extra flavor you could try in. It's all online, of course. Um, okay, so let's go to FASTA. I've done this the last time. So here's the scheme. What FASTA is doing is uh, it tries to find uh, these, these diagonals again. Um, and you know, you see that uh, the FASTA people are aligning people. You see where the origin in the table is. The, the diagonals are now as, as we used to, but like last. Um, so basically, the first step is trying to find uh, diagonals between the, 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 the query sequence and the database sequence. And uh, this is done, unlike last, really having identical fragments. Yeah. Last has these tables allowing uh, mutations or differences. Here it's really identical. Uh, I already told you, I think, well, let's, let's stay here, that the word size in fast A is 2. So basically, if I would sketch it, it, it is something. See? Yeah. So what, what do you want to make? Make fast? So how would you normally do it? So suppose you have a, we go again, search matrix. And let's say here is your query sequence. Here is your database sequence. And uh, so let's say that is one of the, uh, there is a word, um, all kinds of words, but here is ER. Maybe uh, 
Um, here is an, uh, here's another ER word. So, what would you do? So basically what you do is you take the first two words, two, two tuple in the, in the query sequence, and you scan and you say, is there, well, well, you're here, is there ER in the first in the database? Is it here, is it here, is it here? And perhaps you're lucky one time or a few times and you find that word, and you would have two of these lines. So basically, for each here, you scan, you scan everything like this. This is the uh, non-computer aware way of doing it, right? This is, this is, this is quadratic, right? like, like you would fill a dynamic programming language. What is the ID class? Is massaging, pre-processing the sequence such that you go through here, but immediately you put CER in the database sequence, you would know immediately, oh, that's here, and here it appears. Yeah? For any word in the query sequence, you know that position immediately, and that makes that you only need to scan in this uh, through the database sequence, and you know the two words. Uh, that, that would be identical to where you are in your database sequence immediately. So that makes it much fun. So last day is trying to provide or has the technology to do this and it uses hashing to accomplish it. So let's see where are we? Ah, we need to cut the D. Okay. Um, so let's do it. So basically I'll go to this slide now immediately. This was all about hashing, we talked about this. In this slide, so you have seen the t-shirt. So we were here the last time, right? Okay, so this is basically the hash table. You see the query sequence where the query sequence is here. And you see there is three times ER, right? You see the position, the position one, the position, what is it, five, and the position eleven. Um, so what do you want to know? You want to store these positions. So you see here the table, ER happens at position 1 and 5 and 10 in the query sequence. RL, you can look for yourself, it's the second word here. So that happens at, oh, at position 2 and apparently also at position 6. Correct, yeah? You see all the words in the query sequence in order. And here are their addresses. Now, now we need to connect it, but that's this hash function. So this is this, uh, what was the difficult word? Five, oh, I forgot about it. five decimal, I guess, five decimal, 20 base searching. So here you go. So ER, what is the, uh, and it is protein letters, right? Here are the protein letters. We count zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. So here you can see, so the letter E in this key, what is this cardinal number? It's one, two, three, right? Now, so that means what you do is you, you, you put this in, in the 20 base, so the, 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 the address to store the information about the ER word is apparently according to the E, so you start from right to left, so the position of R is apparently 14, it's here, yep, just before 15, and the, and the E is position three, so you make that in this number three, decimal 20 base, so this is the, the, the single units, and this is the 20 units, you don't need more, you only need to go back to 400, as a combination of about two words in the real lesson world. So this is the address then, and that would, uh, so that is, uh, in, in decimal would be, uh, what is it, 74 I guess, right? This is the address. So you do this for all of those words, and now we build a data structure in the machine, you could do this in your Python code, uh, for example, so here you go, how do we so what do we need to know? We want to store immediately these, these three positions, one, five, and ten. Now look with me at the ER, where is the address? What was it again? What do we see here? 74. So you feed ER. The hash function says immediately, okay, the, the stuff, your position information is to be followed at address 74. Here you go, 74. What do you find? One. What is what is this? One you think? It's the first position. But that's not enough. You need also to store 5 and 10 somewhere, right? Because this one is repeated. So then you have so-called, so this is how these people did it. Fast A people, you can do this in many different ways. But they have this array for the, for the addresses. And then when you get an overflow and there is more than one address, they have another array where they store the other addresses. What do we need to do? And how does that work? 
So the one is here, and now they want to store, for example, five. What do you do? It's a chaining array, so you follow up on this one. You go to address one now, this one. And what do you find there? Go and we hold. Address five. It's five. It's encoded like this. And then is there more to be found? What do you do? Um, how would you stop? Let's take another one that is only there one time. For example, LF. Look at that one. Maybe that's better to start. What's your address? Calculate it quickly. That's 184 is the address. What do you find in 184? Three. Is there any more we need to store? No, it's the only one. So what happens? You go to the address three in the chaining array. In the secondary array, do you find zero? That's the end of it. That means it's only three, and now we're done for that. This one, as we see, has three addresses. So what happens? You go to the hash here. You find one here. There is no zero now here. So it's not the end of the story. So now we take that. This is the address then. And now we look in address 5. Is there anything else? Is there a zero there? No. So we go on. 10. Is there more after 10? Is there an extra position where it will be? Look at address 10. So that means done. Yeah. Can be done in different ways? This is one way. That's how these people live. So how long does this array have to be? Never longer than C. So that's, that's how they do it. This is a quick the hash function, and this is the way to do it. So what have you got? If you, so basically, they use this table now like this. They scan the database sequence, and immediately when the word ER is there in the database sequence, you know, immediately, okay, 1, 5, and 10, put the diagonal. So this is a quick way of finding this correspondence of the diagonals between the query sequence that has been pre-processed in the database sequence. Could you do this for the whole database? We talked, uh, we talked about that the last time. Would that be possible? Just think about, you know, the, what is it, 8 million sequences in a database or so. You could sort of do this, make them all in one long sequence, and then do the same thing. You could do that. And then, it, you know, you have two tables, you have one table for the query sequence, you have one table for the database. And it's not immediately. You go down that list and you know everything. You don't need even slides for this. Much but of course, it costs all the memory to build this. So we could do that. So considerable memory supplies, but computers are large enough to do this. So that about I wanted to tell you. So not about hashing. This, of course, is, is just a very, fairly simple hash function. You know one thing for sure, by the way, if you do it like this, can there be a clash? No, because you have this number of systems. Every two word, by definition, will evaluate to another, to another one. Yeah? Okay, that's what I wanted to tell you about. So I've actually been fast there. So let's, let's go on. Um, yeah, so why are we all doing this again? No, we, we compare sequences to, to learn about them. We know about uh, the gap between uh, sequential data, sequence data and databases and structural and functional data. There are far more se sequential sequence data and uh, so this is the thing, we try and establish a relationship at the sequence level and because we know that structure and function is more conserved than, than sequence, we can, from this established relationship, a putative relationship, we can start guessing that then, you know, if there is a relation here, but then also there is certainly a relationship at the structural and functional level of sequence functions. Okay. This is one other thing. This is a um, uh, modern family of, of, of modern blast um, versions, incarnations. But this is now that, that um, we know what is psi blast. Basically, you try and establish a sense of family. So you, yeah, you go in iteration, you know you get hits, and in the end you build, you use information from family members of your previous brothers of the sequence in, and maybe sisters, and maybe nephews, and, and cousins, and so on, family members. And we must probably have, you know, belong to the same sequence family, and of course also the same structure family. Um, another thing is that what you don't use is many sequences in a database, different sequences, might also be part of the family. But you only look, you know, at each database sequence in, the, in isolation. So the idea is here, Try and group the database into all kinds of families you can 
but you do this only once. You have families now in, instead of single sequence, and then you compare a query family with these database families. And that methodology, the, the advantage is your database is smaller, you can put in families, uh, and you do profile profile comparison in, 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 in some way, and uh, you, but you gain a lot of sensitivity. Researchers are far more sensitive, you're able to find the relationship between more divergent sequence examples. And that's what you can see here. Uh, this is normal blast as we know it, so the higher the better, of course. And uh, so this is less error in the search. And you see that you know the, the profile profile methodology. So side blast is really quite a bit better than blast. I guess those of you who have done uh, fundamentals of mathematics have found that fact. Hopefully, there might should be something wrong. We have a strange example. Um, and you see that all this other technology, profile profile, is really those things as well. So HHPRED, for example, is a good one to find. It's all there, readily available for you on the internet. Right. Okay. I want to talk about a few things uh, here, but um, one of the main questions, of course, is if you have a, if you have a, a, a hit and an, 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 an alignment between the query sequence and the database sequence, you know, how can we trust the score you get? We know that some families are far more related at the sequential level than other families, so what does a raw alignment score mean? So basically, you need to resort to some statistical scheme to, to get a sense of, uh, of significance of those scores. Um, so, one of the easier ones, although it's, uh, it's, uh, it's computationally not so cheap, one of the ways is you, you have a sequence alignment with a score, two sequences are aligned, you have the score, the score is x, then alignment, now you want to test the significance of x, what can you do? Scramble both sequences. Scrambling means you, order, you change the order of all the letters in the sequence randomly, you could do this with both sequences, you want to save a bit of time, you only do it with one sequence, of course, if you randomize one sequence, then you have a random relationship anyway. You don't need to do the other sequence. You do that, and then you use multiple randomizations, so multiple seeds. You generate, say, a thousand randomized sequences. You get a thousand alignment scores now. You align them, and then you can you have the pool of these random scores, and you, uh, you, you calculate the mean value of those, and then you can calculate the sort of z-score, which is, you know, how far is your score x, your original alignment score, over or under the mean calculated the number of times. Yeah. Uh, what is uh, yeah, and of course, you know, how much time does this take? You have one alignment calculated, now you have a thousand randomized sequences, so you calculate a thousand alignments to be able to do this. So this uh, slows the down thing quite considerably, and that is the reason why database searching programs are not, they don't do this, it's too slow. Okay? And uh, here you see what the z-score means in, in practice, if you are away, if you're within one standard deviation, you have roughly 70% of your the scores you expect and so on. Eh? So the more you are an outlier, here you're, you're, you're only in the 2% class of your outlier. Right? And the 8% is within the distribution there. And uh, as is written here, we have quite strict sequence analysis when you use this way of scoring. So we go to four to six standard deviations before we, uh, we proclaim. So that's here. So I don't know where we are. Under one percent. Far under one percent. That's what you need to do to the Okay. Um, yeah. Why? Scoring, and of course, you know, you, you want to make a scoring system to do biology. So basically, you hope that the higher the score is, the higher the chance that you observe a biological relationship or an evolutionary relationship. But that's where things, of course, can go wrong. And um, so, what are we using in a scoring? In fact, we, we simplify the world a lot. And we think that uh, one matrix with 400 numbers can represent the whole of evolution. I don't, we use it anyway, and, um, oops, sorry, um, so that's what you have here, we use a 
risk of change matrix and some gap penalties and uh, good luck, good biology. And, and uh, you know, in life, you also use some characteristics of a sequence database, the size of it, how many sequences and what residue composition overall is there in the database. These are used as parameters for the fast change. Right? And um, yeah, so the way it lasts, so fast, I, fast I factors earlier than the last, but some, there are quite some other methods that do last uh, searching. You know probably by now that there are two main scores in last, a bit score and an e-value. And we'll talk a bit more on this. What is a bit score? B stands for the bit score. What is it? It's a, this is the raw score, the raw alignment score. You know, your, uh, the sum of your uh, blossom scores, if you like, minus gap penalties. The raw score, and you see that the B score is nothing else than bit score. as a linear combination of the original score. See that? It's scaled by a lambda scaling factor. Something is subtracted, and that is just divided by the constant numbers, and that's not so interesting mathematically. So these two parameters are of significance. And how do you get to those? Basically, people have done work on this for the most widely used matrices. These, these parameters, by the way, are related to your exchange matrix. So PEN 250 would have a different set of lambda and k values as blossom 62. There are lists for those parameters pre-calculated by all kinds of people who know how to do that. So for most matrices, you don't need to calculate these numbers in there. And that's why BLAST can just, you know, has all these, for all of its the matrix is it used, it has these values, it can convert any score to the B score to the bit score. Yeah. What is nice about this normalization? Why would you bother to do this? Well, it allows you now to use a score calculated by 10 to 50 or by blossom 62, and you can readily compare them. Before, as you might remember, score for triple fan state, triple fan W, W of 17 in 10 to 50. I think it's also, check me out, I think it's 11, maybe 12. Anyway, that's different. You could not compare them. If you convert it, you can. So that's convenient if you want to align it with another matrix and look, okay, how do we, is the score better now or not? You can do this using these levels. So that's, uh, that's convenient. That's why this score is there in the example. Now, there's the other score, the E value, as you might know. Um, and so the e value is, is really maybe more statistical, and it, it's derived from a p value. Yeah, so you need a null model aligned uh, based on random sequences again, and the p value is uh, sort of the probability, of course, that something would occur by pure chance. And that is, we will compare our scores with the score resulting from pure chance. And normally, how do you use p values? If uh, you know the p-value the smaller the better, so you, you set some threshold, and if the p-value is lower than the threshold, well, you proclaim it a hit. Most people call it a significant hit sequence as a relationship with pure chance. So how would you know to define in this business a p-value? It's the probability of seeing at least one or more <coughs> scores s. So you have a pure uh, <coughs> Compared to a, a given database sequence, you get a score X, and now you say, will I get by chance at least one score against another sequence without a relationship that scores at least the same? That would be bad news. If you have too many of those, clearly your significance goes down of that score. That is what you do. Now, it turns out, Waterman of England is the Waterman from Swiss and Waterman. He didn't stop there. He worked on, as you can see. Um, uh, this is the Poisson distribution, so this tends to, to, to behave like, not like a normal distribution, a bit, it's a normal life, but it's a bit different, the Poisson distribution. Doesn't matter. From this p-value concept, we go to an e-value. Why do we bother again? You know, we have a protein, we want to find similar proteins in a large database, and at the moment it's given over 11 million sequences in the uh, NCBI's non-redundant database, that's the database that BLAST is using. And, uh, you know, we would like, of course, good hits with low P or E values. How does an E value relate to a P value? E value is really the number of sequences, random sequences if you like in the database, or unrelated sequences if you like, 
that scores at least as good as the database sequence you're interested in. It's the number here. And if that number becomes large, if you, you, know, you have a score between uh, the query and the database sequence, and you get hundreds of the sequences that are unrelated, at that score level, then you say, ooh, that's not so good. That should be a lot less. So this is how it works. And basically, the e-value is the, uh, the exact same as the p-value divided by the number of sequences. Now, I'll, I'll go into how class, how class people implement this. I'll show you in a moment. Basically, how you use an e-value, and I think most of you have done this already. If, for example, e-value would be 0, 0, 1, 100, then you would say, that means that for one search, you find a database search, you would get one hundredth of a sequence. This such a thing, uh, you know, uh, out by chance, meaning you would need to do that search, say, a hundred times to get one sequence, random sequence, out of the database at that score level. And that might give you, well, and now I'm pretty confident this means something. If it will be, if the e-value is five, it means this one search, you think this is something, but you get five unrelated sequences at this score level. And you might conclude, be a bit careful, don't let your future career in all of this. So this is how it works, yeah? the lower <coughs> the better. Okay, now, how do the last people do this? We have to go a bit in history to, uh, was it 1955, where there was a math mathematician by the name of Gumbel who discovered or uh, ran up so-called extreme value distribution, the EVD from now on. And that is uh, a statistical distribution, but it looks a little bit different than the normal distribution. Here you go. What's wrong with this thing compared to the normal distribution? Somebody has kicked it, right? It falls off more slowly here. And, uh, now, the beauty is it's a nasty piece of mathematics, I can tell you, because this reads as follows. The, the, the base function of the extreme value distribution is y equals 1 minus e to the power minus e to the power something. So e to the power e to the power. You've not seen that so far. So you've not calculated it. And, uh, so basically that, uh, the, so uh, the nice thing is that where the thing is positioned and how wide it is, you just need two parameters to be able to describe all of the shapes of all of these curves. Lambda and the mu parameter. And here is, you know, so mu is uh, uh, where it is, and lambda is how, how wide it is. And uh, the decay constant, that's also called. So the, the width of the shape, you know, whether it goes like this, or, you know, is lambda in the position of zero or not, is given by mu. This is what, uh, what uh, the last people, this is a small plot with some of the numbers, but you see that, that they've tested this, this distribution really, so real data follows this distribution really rather nicely, you might say. So this is used, so this extreme value distribution is taken as a model for how these random and real values behave. Right? So it's, they don't work according to a normal distribution, it's a bit different. Um, so basically, why is it from different from random? Well, you do two types of selection, right? What is an alignment? If you align two sequences, how many possible alignments are there? Very many. If you do, you want the best one. So you select rigidly the best out of the pack. And then you do this just for each for the query sequence and each database sequence. So you do this game, selection game, 11 million times. So you select unselected stuff. And that sort of goes well with this e to the power e to the power something with the distribution rather than the the, the normal distribution. Okay, so once again, this was this formula. You see that you find it back because the last people follow it. So one minus e to the power minus e to the power is this is the function, and now they start filling in some constant. You see that the decay constant. And the mu, the positioning, has to do with values that derive from the database. The sequence length, the database length, or the, the total database size, if you like, all the amino acids concatenate all the sequences, and that's your database length. And this k score that we saw before for the bit score, and the lambda as well. 
So you need, again, you need these values, you need to do them for each of the possible scoring matrices, plus seven pound, you name it, and so then you can filter them. So how does it work? If you now go to what the class values really are, then you fill it in. So from this general formula, you go to this one filled in. This is the one. And um, so this, and then here you have your E value. Then this is too complicated to calculate, so it's time to can we simplify this, and then they found a possible simplification. For um, large value x, you see that 1 minus e to the power minus e minus x is roughly the same as e to the minus x. That's convenient, because this nasty e to the power e business is gone, you have this e. So Vlad said, thank you, we use this, so instead of this function with the double e, if you like, it now is this according to the simplification, so we have this is what the distribution. So they can readily calculate from the score, filling this in, and they know uh, the E value of a given score. And um, so that's how you get these E values in the last table. And as you might know, the lower, the more significant, the more you can rely on on the result, on the relationship that you think you find and, and uh, you know, declare a punitive model. <coughs> okay, so what is a bit of the problem? I can tell you a story because what is in these numbers? You can see it here, the size of the database. Okay, so you calculate. So here's the story. Biologist, you comes to you, I have a sequence, could you find out if anything is related? So of course, I will, I will blast for it. Oh, it's, it's a nice E value, here you go. And then that, and we'll try it, try to run the probes, very nice. So next week, the biologist comes into your office, you know, open the arms, you know, what did you do, it's a horrible program, what happened, what happened? Well, the score between the previous sequence and this database sequence, I run the same program. And now it wants, the score is different between two times the same sequence. How can it be? Last week you told me the score is this, and this week the score is different. How can that be? It must be an error in the problem. What do you say always, you're a technologist, this is not a bug, this is a feature. It's meant to be, might be confusing. So what happened during the week? There was an update of the database. It became a bit larger. This is all related to your to the probability of finding stuff. And of course, if your database growth, you have a bit higher chance to find something. There's more to search, there's a higher chance to find it. And that is controlled for, or corrected for, taken care of by this computer system. That's how you pay it. The scores differ after the database of that. So it depends on your database of that. How is it for this one? Um, what about scrambling sequences that I told you about? Is that dependent on size of data? No, it's just a two sequence, you scramble, it takes forever. It's a not dependent upon sizes or anything in the database. So in that sense, you might say this score is more convenient, at least to the biologist, no anger after a week. But uh, it takes too long to kind of really be done. Okay, I've shown you this one, I need to stress this once again, so I show this curve in, maybe this is the last time. Maybe I'll score, show this one time more in the whole course, but I promise no more than one time more, okay? Um, so this was meant to say that the line of quality quickly deteriorates with more divergent sequences. And what is your, what is the best database searching program? You not only like to, to uh, recognize sisters and brothers, but uh, second degree cousins, you know, widely divergent, widely both family members, weak signals, but still a biological relationship. And then you're quickly in this corner. So the technology needs to, you know, we have to be careful. Errors are happening from where we want to search. How bad is it to make an error in blast? What do you get blast? I've shown you the picture. What's the output of blast? What's interesting? What's on top of the list, right? So you worry about the order of the database. This is the best, the lowest deep value. When you go down, you have some threshold. I trusted until here, and now I don't trust it anymore. So does this, do these scores have to be absolutely correct? What is okay? 
you might say, well, as long as the order of the items in your list remains the same, the score is good enough, right? So you can have errors, but it should not lead to a reversal of the order of your list. So then it's, then it's okay. And of course, when you just talk about the alignment, what should the score be? Then you say, no, really, if I have to compare, then the score should just be, you know, within one hundredth of or something. So then this order argument is not relevant. It has to be better. Okay. And here you see, of course, that, you know, if sequences become distant, you get errors. Which is just what I explained to you. Now, where are we now in the world? How many sequences are there? You know how many genomes have been sequenced? You know, right? I should be, you know why? Because in industry, there are maybe a million genomes of scary bugs or these people keep down sequences, they like firewalls. And they do stuff, earn money, or want to tell. So, we don't know. But we know, what is in the public domain, that the three basic kingdoms of life, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya are part of this one, this family, this kingdom. Uh, you know, we have many sequences in the meantime. So we have a fair idea of the genetic variability throughout all kingdoms. That's, uh, that's quite good. And uh, many of the uh, old ideas we had have been corrected or rectified because we know really the genes and the genes. Okay, so and, and why is nice? Well, now we can uh, take a human gene, search, find a hit with a, um, with a material sequence. Suppose this biologist comes in your room again and I write this bit of sequence. Uh, it's a bit of DNA, I don't know what it does. I mean nothing, might be something. I'll run blast for you. And you get a hit sequence out of it, an IC value, and it's a material sequence. And you think, oh, this is fantastic, divergent hit, it's great, let's look at what the function is and tell the biologist, you know, the career is set for this person. Beautiful. And it says nothing, or a known or something. I'll show you a list of nice little cases you might, you might get with. What do you tell the biologist? Should this person work on it? Not. You say, I can't tell you anything. I don't know the score, or I don't know the function now. Does that fact that if it's a hit with a material sequence, might it? Could you use that to raise? Who dares to say something? I, I then I ask you a question. Would that material gene encode eye color? I think. If you have hair on your ears or not, as a man, for example, would that be a single gene? Horrible gene. <laughs> anyway, the answer is no. So what kind of gene would it be? More essential, perhaps? Hey, so what do you tell the audience? Forget about it, don't touch it. <coughs> you say, I don't know what the function is. I tell you, it's an important function. I would let the clear a bit go. Try it for a month, see what happens, okay? So sometimes you don't get the information you like, you don't have like to find, but still sometimes you can use it in the old way, or in this case, even in the same. Now, so now we know the list is of course huge, but you have in all sort of quarters of life we have genome sequences now. And we have very many of course human, because for some reason we're more interested in human sequences than others. It's terrible, but that's how we are. Okay. A little bit more philosophy. You've seen this, these type of things now many times. You know, yeah, this is a DNA sequence. And yeah, this is a protein sequence. But these are live molecules, they have a shape, they do things. They, they happen in each of our 10 trillion cells. Well, we have long cells doing that, but anyway. Um, so, is this really the essence? Is this the level of knowledge, and, and, and should we look at life at this level? Is that really what we want to do? Or is this just, you know, we can't do anything better, we spend our time on this. So, how powerful is formalism? Why are we doing it? Is it just a good way for us to think about it? We use single letter code because then we, uh, it's better than tryptophan, alanine, and protein sequences will be very long for time, right? So single letter is a good idea. Um, but so we have, we have designed in history, of course, very many. And in biology, uh, DNA was, of course, important. What did he do? He was, did it at Leiden. He had a tree like. He wanted to find a key to find out if families and order 
the organisms that he knew to be at the planet at this time. And he made the classification system. Yeah, there's two names, uh, Drosophila, Melanogaster. You say this all because of Ineas, the name structure. Darwin, and all of his stuff is evolution. Discussed this. You find uh, fitness, you find uh, the, the fight, and the survival of the fittest, and so on. That's all Darwin. Well, Turing, I showed you Turing machine, was fundamental for computer science. But these sometimes are, are models of things, right? And uh, I don't have to be in Brussels, you know, I go into the Magritte Museum, very good. And he had one thing, he has this, and he said, this is, this is French, right? This is not a problem sequel or anything. This is French. <laughs> and this, um, uh, it's written here, this is not a pipe. What does he mean? This looks like a pipe, doesn't it? You still remember pipes. You have to see the young people. I had a granddad. He spoke cigars. I would always have the unexpressible desire to do to, to this in the ashtray where all the my items <laughs> were I don't know, I could still do it. Um, anyway, so I remember, right? Um, so this is not a pipe. And, and now, 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 my question to you, according to most things, would this have been a protein? Or not? And that picture in the computer that you see after this is great, it's not a protein. That's the wrong ID. You know, if you, you see these pictures, you'll see this in the next course, right? You see even shiny, metal-like protein structures. And if you see that as a human, you're innocent, you think, this is very stable. Proteins are stable. That's what you get. As a so, are proteins stable? 42 degrees of fever, how's that? Is that very good? Not good, right? Why not? Proteins are fall apart. These things are highly unstable. Amazing that they're there sometimes. But we need. Uh, so this is another problem. So that's that's with all of this world. What are we doing? Think about this. You get you get perception based on models, and it's all not free. It's all not real. These are models. We think about it. Okay. So what is still the power of it? According to uh, you know, if you compare sequences, we get you know, given on sequence identity. According to the model, you see that the, the pen distance. So if the sequence identity is uh, below 20%. Very quickly, you go to 600 million years of evolution, according to, uh, to some of the models, right? But basically, what do you see? If you have identity, the relationship that you see goes down quickly. This is when you look at it at the sequence, sequential level. This is sequence information. Now, if you do the same game using structural information, comparing protein not based at the sequence level, but we compare the three-dimensional structures, I give you a feel how that goes, then the plot looks like this, a lot more messy. And people are positive, they say, oh, but this is much better, because look, it goes down much more sharply, and that's very good. So it's more sensitive. And others say, well, yeah, you say this for some it's more sensitive, but here it's a complete mess. So you see, the variability is larger at the structural level, but if you're lucky, you are down more quickly than, than here, than here than, than in the early. So, okay, how does it work? This is how we compare the next course, right? So it'll be very, very brief. Otherwise, you will get boring next course if I tell everything now. Um, so I'll keep doing it so fast that you won't remember that's the idea. And uh, so anyway, so these are three protein structures, schematized, three colors as you see. And these are protein structures that are pretty much alike, you can see, right? They, 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 they wind in the same way through space. And basically, how do you compare? You take these, uh, these points, this is the main chain only of a protein, and then the C alpha 1 atom in the main chain for each amino acid. You take this point of reference, and then you could say these three uh, alpha atoms are, uh, are uh, equivalent, so we look at the distance between those. And you have corners like here, where the distances are bigger, and you have very good corners like here, where the three proteins really nicely superpose. So, right? you try to put them on top of one another as good as possible. And then you have, this is next course, right? And here you see another example, where you can see that here, when it's red, the overlap is better than when you look here, where you see you know, two structures deviate. They don't fit as well, one thing. These things are superposed as rigid bodies. Shape, put two hands, 
month traditionally you try to put them on top. Okay. Next course, the idea is structure is more conserved than sequence as we know. So if you're able to compare stuff at the structural level, that will be good. But these are the complications you get into if you do. Okay, so how can we assess how good we are? How can we find out in scoring systems? And uh, how do we have a standard of truth? And of course, in reality, the answer is no. But we have many databases that we use that are structural. There are a few that we can use where the alignments are in to compare what do we find this last, what's the score, and how good is it? To get them, you know, at least say this program we think is better than, than this one. And uh, so, what do you do? Of course, you, uh, you run blast, you find the hit from the database, and you check whether that relationship is found by like any of the databases. If it's okay, you're happy. If it can't be found in the reference database, you're less happy. And you have, of course, if you really want to test programs, you do not do this for one query search, but you use many searches to calculate how good you are and compare programs based on the list of Search. Also, database is uh, an annotated database that really describes as a structural alignment. So it's basically a multiple alignment hidden in this database. You see gaps in the sequences, so if you put these the sequences under one another immediately, it's a multiple alignment. And these are these are alignments that we should trust, at least according to you. These alignments are structural. We are experts. Trust us. This is good. So we could use the database. Now, I think you've, most of you have thought about this in the past. What does it mean if you run the blast search? You have a query sequence. Say a global sequence. What would you hope to get? You run it against the database of 11 million sequences, and you hope to get out of 200 global sequences that are in the database, and of course not the that. That would be the perfect search. So, what would you hope to have? The 200 global sequences should be here and all the rest would fall seamlessly under the magic fashion. And we know, of course, in reality, that won't work always. So here's what might happen in practice. So that the sequences that are out of the same family of your theory are in blue, the sequences that are not belonging to that family are in red. And what do you get? Maybe, hopefully, your top of the list is a good one, the second of your list is okay, the third already wrong. It's not a family. Fortified. So basically, lower in your positive list, you will get errors. And then this is under the, so this should be unrelated, and you know, but there are two sequences that are related that you can find. That can happen too. And basically, you get, of course, more errors closer to the threshold, low in the, in the positive list, and higher up in the list. So how can we uh, calculate, how can we calculate things? You've done this already, so I'm repeating part of what you learned already. Um, you calculate it, there are all kinds of scores. So basically, there are four possibilities, of course. You say this database sequence should be a hit, it can be right or wrong, and you say here this database sequence should not be a hit, should be unrelated. Four possibilities, here they are. True positive should be related, and it turns out to be false positive should be related. It turns not out to be, it turns out not to be. Say that the negative side, the true negative is, you know, it should not be related, and it turns out not to be related, and something that, according to the blast, is not related, in fact, false negatives. Here are most of the measures you can calculate to find, to get a feel how good you are, which ones are mostly used, which ones did you use in your project the last, uh, the last course. Probably sensitivity and specificity, right? It's the other side of the coin, really. This is the positive value, this is just the same thing negative. How can we make, give me a blast program that has 100% sensitivity? How should it work? What does 100% sensitive mean? These are all the positives in the database, right? So it's fraction you find of all the related sequences. How can you ramp that up to 100%? It's so difficult and easy. What if you say, the whole database is related? Fantastic. Cheap programming, huh? You just uh, 
print out the data. So that's great. But what, what, so that scores 100% calculated. He said, but what happens with the passive is in there? Quite a bit lower, probably approaching zero. <coughs> if you write answers 200 sequences out of 11 million, then the specificity goes way down. Right? So that's not, it's, it's, it answers a question that you see, so the other measures are important too. Now, this one is also very often used, cost this prediction value, to put this, you know, that would be here, three out of five. Right? We, uh, we find five bits that are supposed to be positive, 60% of the time is correct. Right? Three out of, out of five. There are a few more values. We test probability, here go, and in the medical arena, people try all these measures, you know why. Physicists, eh, when they have a relationship, you need a correlation of at least 0 0.7, 0 0.8 before a physicist say, this is something, right? What is the p-value of a physicist? Is it 5% like all that do? No. Nope. For real, they go always at 1%. Big difference in the medical domain. It is never a It's all noise. So we have a correlation of 0.3. We write big papers, 0.3 or big letters. So this is great. More people believe it. That's what you do in medical reading. So they, they invent all kinds of measures. And if one of those scores at least something that might be suggestive, you know, we write a paper, right? So that's why you have all many scores in the medical domain. OK, so how are we going to use this? Basically. What is the best glass program? Tell me. Use this color. What's I uh, already told you, right? So how should the, how should this look in colors? Blue on the top and red on the right, sharp line in between the bits. Okay. So what does that mean if you make that into a curve here? Now we go here. So what game are we going to play? You've played the game already, I believe. So anyway, we say you know what? We go down the hit list of glass and we check whether it was okay or not. If the hit was really good, it was a related sequence, we check the database of the, the, the reference, we go one step up, and if it turns out, oh, I thought it was a hit, and it turns out, you don't relate it, you step to the right. What is your perfect glass program? Up, 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 till what? Till you hit your head against the ceiling, what is that? After your 200 globins are wiped out, then of course what you find later is all wrong, clearly. So, but the idea is you go up, and then you go, that's the best. How do programs, do all programs do this? No, when you get errors on the way, you get steps to the right, and hopefully not to do it. Basically, what's the mathematics behind it? Okay, you find, you might say there is a distribution of the real hit sequences, positive distribution if you like, and there is a distribution of the unrelated sequences, and hopefully your scoring system will give you a bit higher score for the related distribution, but the problem is there is really an overlap between uh, biologically related sequences and biologically unrelated sequences. And that makes for a problem. Basically, so what are we doing as you know? Um, so the, the, you have the, what do you the plot here, the true positive fraction, it's called not true positive, and if you go wrong, you have a false positive, so this is a false positive fraction. And the, the more like this you plot will be, the happier you are. And basically, if you are at a certain score level, you could say, consider at this level, I don't find so many sequences, but at least I can be more certain about it because the overlap with the negative distribution is small, and this plot is even better. Now the overlap is small. Right? Depending on where you are, you get better. Now, what does this curve tell you? Two problems. Which one would you use? This one is better because it's more like this than that. Yeah. More going, okay, it goes up more. What about a curve like this? <coughs> the lines cross, which you said. Which one to use? Say it again? Absolutely. Ask one. Could you, could you close one? Are you asking for this? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
come with this program, otherwise you would say, no, oh, I would read hundreds of them and I will go to research all of them, see what happens, and so it's really depending on the question. Very good. So basically, I tried to, to allude to that already a bit, so, you know, sensitivity, how many you get out of the database, real this, and specificity and selectivity are in a balance. Yeah? You can make it one e good easily, the other good, but you have a balance that's for tricky, right? If this one improves, then it tends to go down. Yeah? Okay, so basically what are we all doing in, 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 in this blast type searching or database searching in general? You do a matching phase, you know, you do, you do your basically your local alignment mostly here, in a fast way, with cameras and so on, you uh, should break Ah, oh, coffee! Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so basically, Blast uh, and Star say most of these programs are two-step rockets, right? A very quick phase, called the matching phase here, trying to write off sequences that obviously are unrelated, although, you know, philosophically you cannot do this. Alignment scores and a low score does not mean no biological relationship. It means you cannot ascertain a given relationship, and we know there are examples of sequence scoring below any random threshold but still being biologically related. So anyway, so you have to be careful. Then those that make it well enough to rescore, you redo what is BLAST doing, it goes into the two hit method sequences that make the two hit methods are totally realigned, really using full dynamic programming in this two directional way. So spending more computational expense on it. But then you have hopefully a reliable or a near reliable alignment, and then you go to the selection phase, score it, put in some statistical criteria, well defined in blast with the, with the, the hit score and the evaluation. And uh, you can hopefully say something and reason about homology. That's basically what we try to establish. Okay, so. Um, here you have all kinds of methods for secret searching, of course, heuristic alignment is last and fast now doing, and then the programming expensive, but it's used in each of those programs. We'll do suffix trees, that will be later lectures. We've seen it a bit, right? We've seen suffix trees. You remember the program? We were running it, I think, at the moment, the effective of PWA. Okay. And then, talk about this as well in the later lecture, pattern matching. You know, what is this pattern I'm interested in really to be found in, uh, in sequences? And I've shown you five last today, it's one of those things, but there's quite a bit more on that, but I'll come back to it on that a bit later. Okay. We've seen that side blast is more sensitive than blast. You've established that fact in most of your practical work in the last course, in the methods of bioinformatics. Um, and so iteration is a good idea. And of course, it's good to realize again that homologous families are normally, well, the name implies, organized in families of homologous proteins. Um, and that is a nice uh, to have that because it's a good idea to compare proteins at the family level. And um, profile profile searching is one of the possibilities to, uh, to use this uh, this as a reason, to exploit this as Okay, now this is this, uh, this be careful thing. You miss a lot of relationships that are biological because our scoring systems will not track it because the signal is just very, very weak. So looking for consistency, looking for additional information is very often a good idea when you're trying to find weak patterns. Okay, um, and uh, the idea there is that, that if it's searching, you get more information. Uh, in sidebars, as you know, you use the family ID, and you use that to search as a search image to try and find more remote family members. Okay, here you've got one piece of technology, it's called COC, stands for COG, I must say, stands for cluster of orthologous groups. And what's the ID? 
normally what what you do, you have some, some, some query sequence and you try to establish a relationship with this sequence. Now, if you would know this sequence is part of this family, meaning if you would find identify this sequence as a hit, you could then reason like, okay, since this one is part of the family and this is a hit, this has a relationship with the query sequence, then this one should also have a relationship with the query sequence. So you can enrich your search. Yeah. So now basically if you want to establish a relationship with this sequence, any score with any of the other sequences in the, in the family will give you some information. Can be used. That is what basically Cox is doing, it's a whole program. And, uh, and one of the most cited scientists in all the field, Eugene Cooley, is the uh, <coughs> this, uh, Mr. Um, okay, do I have more on bi yeah, bidirectional best hit? Another way. To really be sure, we want to use BLAST. And um, what is BLAST doing? You establish using a query sequence, putative relationships or putative homologous relationships with ships with sequences in the, uh, the database. So how can you be very, very sure about that? And here is an ID. So how can you be absolutely sure? Suppose you have uh, here, uh, we have a cow genome here. Uh, the names here of the species. No, let's say A is a cow genome and B is a horse genome, right? You take a cow gene, small a. You run that gene against the database of genes in horse. You find a hit. So how do you, what would be the best if the gene B is found, searching with A as a query sequence, and maybe B is on top of the list of A as a query sequence. That's nice. Is that good enough? So it is if you really want to be sure, maybe we should do it in the other way as well. If we say, hey, how do we find orthology? What was orthology again? Like orthology, but what was it? Corresponding that gene, these two genes were one thing in the in the original species, in the uh, ancestral sequence, right? So they're really corresponding. They were once. So if you find this is on the top of the list, but would you like to have this additional information? So A recognizes B as its nearest neighbor in the other genome. Is that strong enough? Some people feel no. It would also be good if, if you run using the gene B, horse gene, if you run that gene against the cow database of sequences, if then A would appear on top of the list for <coughs> sequence B, then we have the which broke. Uh, situation, which broke situation, and uh, that would be uh, more meaningful. So that's an idea, and this is called that it's now a bi directional best hit. Right? So to establish an operational definition of orthology. So you run blast in one direction, you run blast in the other direction. If both are the best hit of the other, top of the list, then you say, hey, this is, uh, do we now know if you tell this to a biologist? Professionalities, see these parts, and all the have been there. It's rubbish. You have to know this. And you have to measure the fruit fly, not this nonsense, hanky panky with computers. Come on. But anyway, we say, look, we have these databases. We need to think about the stuff that's in. You know, we find the reasonable thing, things, and we think it's reasonable. So, this one way, bi directional best hits. Question to you. You know that there are repeats of sequences, right? Suppose in this cow genome here, there is a sequence A prime here. It's a, it's a repeat of A. What would happen? What would happen? You run the sequence, you get B as its nearest name, on top of the list. Now you take B as the query, what could happen? What would you want to happen to establish the idea that A prime is a need, the sequence bit here, that's a copy of that guy. What would happen if you run the B, you think, in the list? A on top, A prime on top. What about the idea of second best hit? Bi directional second best. So you can play with this technology and extend it and work out of it. So alignment is also good for finding repeats, but I showed you that in an earlier lecture. So just the things you can do. Okay, going into the problems. Some fun starts now. I have to tell you, I do one difficult thing. Tell you when you have to sort of try and pay attention for a minute. If you want to sleep, that's fine too. A minute of this. That's fine.
Still sleeping now, sorry, the energy. Anyway, uh, so these are just a list of some problems. Eh? Um, uh, domain, proteins can be multi domain, sort of composite proteins with uh, multiple things. I'll show you a picture of that. Low complexity I'll do, that will be the difficult thing. I'm talking about low complexity. Redundancy, you know, the Google. Um, uh, the Google ranking and so on, you know, so what page will you look at you Google search? Three, one, two, maybe you stop anyway. You can do that in last two. Short query sequences, statistics, get in trouble, distant sequences, hard to find. So let's go through a few of those. Multi-domain proteins first. Here we got a nasty example of a three-domain protein. I'll talk you through it. Do you see the beginning of the protein and do you see the end? Do you see that? These things are sticking out. Okay, so this protein runs like you can see it here still. Ah, I should say one other thing. It's clear to you that this is a domain, separate section, and this is a domain. Would I have been able to turn this picture? Then you would have seen that under here is also a third domain that is clearly distinct from the second, but it's hard to see. At least before one. It's all about trust in this life. But anyway, um, so there are three separate domains. So how does the protein chain run? It starts in domain A goes in domain B, goes in domain C, goes back in domain B, goes back in domain A. So does that mean for what sections of the sequence are these domains composed? Here we go. Domain 1, the blue one, is composed in the sequence. It went in, went through, came back out. So this bit and that bit together built this structural part. How is domain 2 built, the middle domain? Green. This bit going in here, going the third, get back in the two, so here go the third, get back in the two. The green bits make up for domain two. Domain three is the only one, as you can see, that is built of the second piece of sequence. So we talk here about continuous domains. Which one is continuous? This one, the lower domain, because there's only one bit of sequence. Filling it. I see some faces that are rather unhappy. They're just a Friday afternoon feed with related to this nature. Anyway, um, uh, so this is built out of two sections. Yeah? So these are called discontinuous domain. It means this domain is built up out of two regions, fragments, segments in this one sequence. Okay, multi domain protein. This is one protein with one function, but it's a composite function from these three. You see it's nucleotide binding, substrate binding, the regulatory, this has to do with, uh, with genes, making genes. Okay, with BLAST, it can be that your query sequence, you might know in a lot, is a query sequence, or you have a database sequence, that is a multi-domain sequence of this kind. So what could happen? And now we talk about sign blasts, remember iterative. So we start really. Uh, Cyblast first, you know, you start running with this sequence. It's a two domain sequence, it has domain A and domain B. In the database, there is a sequence, domain B, domain C. Well, the class is a problem, so it says, hey, I see a relationship with B. Local alignment, very good. This is a, a hit. This is, this is homologous. And blast is right. So, if it says, that's fine, what does Cyblast do? It takes this hit, it's a good scoring hit. Puts it in the query sequence, in the profile. You look, you look search again at the profile. Now we have this information. So this sequence is in the database still. And now class says, hey, I see a good hit, a good relationship with this sequence. Domain C is now. So this hit, this sequence is now also added to the pack and used the information. But you know, if you look at this sequence and the query sequence, what do you say? No. you very difficult to deal with. This is a very mundane way of dealing with it. It basically says, you know, what we do this, but we only do it not more than 20% outside the period. So it may extend, but not so that you could get complete domains in through the side door because that would be the Yeah? Chaining problem. Okay? Be careful. One of the potential pitfalls in database searching. Multi-domain, you, you, you probably run a Google search, right? Now, to be honest, when you're slow. Page 1, page 2, page 50, really. If you go to page 10, you really want to find something, right? Amazing. You don't want to 
struggle for first class so. Next one, so, go to a party. Anyway, uh, so it could still be that you have a multi-domain protein where uh, you know there's a very interesting domain and there are not so many of those sequences in the database, but it's linked to a kinase domain, and there are thousands of kinase sequences in the database. What happens to a Google problem? 5,000 or more hits with kinase, and then the really interesting stuff starts, but you stop looking, as you do with Google searching. So that's uh, that's another problem. Um, so that's the, uh, the the Google ranking problem. Low complexity. I'm going to have to stop you. But I'll warn you when it's really pretty fast, okay? Um, what was that again? Look at a sequence like this. This looks pretty nice. So if you use this sequence to search, what about this region? Does it really have a profile? Do you think there are proteins like that? So basically the idea is this is a reduced alphabet. You can see that because not all possible letters happen in this region. And that leads to a reduced search definition. This is not so good as a search image, and that is why last Masti, so it, it looks at this, then branded low complexity these regions, and blast Marston, it will not try and compare these bits, it's there in the sequence, but it will not score any comparison between these regions and, and, and the data the sequence. Okay? And well, the masking goes like this. Just way out, you see this in the blast output, as I've shown you the Okay, this is the minute. There you go. But I go quickly in the example to soften your little bit. Okay? So this is the minute. So how do we score how many low complexity sequences are? What does that mean, low complexity? And basically, the theory is about you have a bit of sequence. What would be the highest complexity by the way? Well, I'll tell you low complexity of the sequence would be P, 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 or probably at low complexity. But Q, uh, A, C, D, E, F, G, and so on, that's high complexity, a lot of variability, you know, well-defined sequences, that's, that's what we want. So, last would like a program that has been made, and it's called SEX, S-E-G-S, -E and uh, uh, so that, that's calculates it. Now, I'll show an example that's easier. Here we go. Here is the sequence. Do you think it's low complexity or not? Oh, this is a DNA sequence, by the way. As you see, it's uh, two out of four letters are present, right? And you know there are two A's and three T's. Okay, so this is a sequence of length five. Let's establish the parameters. The alphabet size for DNA is four, four different letters. And this is the composition vector. A vector. Well, that's maybe quite easy, but you see, you know, you score how many T's, how many A's, how many C's, how many T's there are in the sequence. Here is your answer, three T's, two A's, and the other two A's. <coughs> right? So far, so good. Now we do one other thing, to, to one other piece of bookkeeping. This is, um, what was the sequence? So this is how many different letters were not there in the sequence. But then we see C and G are not there. So there are two types that are not there. How many letters were there one time in the sequence? I don't know. See, uh, one is, is two times a T. Uh, a is two times a T, three times basically. So this is how you build up that vector. There is uh, there are two letters not there. So what? So zero occurrences are two letters, namely C and G. There is there is no occurrence of a single letter. There is one occurrence of a letter that happens two times. Do you know which letter? The letter A, there is one letter that occurs three times, the letter T, there is uh, zero letters that occur four times, and there are zero letters that occur five times. Okay? Now, if we have this, now we can ask the following questions. And these are these difficult things you saw on the slide here. We do it here for this example. Basically, how many different sequences of this composition can I make? How do you calculate that? So it could be that you know this T goes to the first position and so on, and so you have to spread two A's and three T's in all different ways. The way to calculate this is to say, look, um, total possibility is um, is here. Um, you have uh, five faculty possibilities, basically, if all the letters would be different. 
and each uh, permutation that's called would lead to a different sequence. So that's what we do. We just pretend for a moment that all five letters are different. So then the total would have been five faculty, right? But all these letters are not all different. We have three T's. What does that mean? If you exchange those T's, it will of course lead to the same sequence. Right? You cannot tell one T for the other. So that is where the three faculty and the two faculty come. Because there are the three T's, you can interchange those and it doesn't matter. And because there are two A's, you can interchange those and it doesn't matter either. So that is what you get. The total possibilities, if all that would have been different, is five faculty, but you need to normalize that with the letters occurring three times, three faculty, and two faculty for the A's. Yeah? That's what? Half a minute passed, right? Okay. Uh, of what we did so far. So this, is, this means, so you can try and do it, there are 10 different possible sequence orderings of this composition. Okay, something to remember. Now this is about, would the complexity have been different, you think, if the A would have been a G? If the sequence would have read G, T, T, G, T. Same complexity, right? So, ah, that's interesting. So you could ask the question, how many different compositions would give rise to this complexity? And there again is what you really see is important. I could uh, turn an A into a C. I could turn an A into a G. It would be the same. I should not turn the A into a T and leave the T because then we have something else, obviously. And so on and so forth. So there are possibilities. You calculate it like that. Now you use this strange thing. And what do you say here? The two faculty is the two letters that were there are important because they reduce the number of possibilities. And uh, so, and, and, and the two letters that are there two times or three times in this group. And you know, zero, zero faculty, what is that? It's the value of one, I see a finger, one finger, very good, and one faculty is just one finger, so so Yeah, okay, so there are 12 in this example, 12 different compositions that, um, Something happening in that corner for the mouse? Somebody staring at us. Can the mouse be in there? Perfect. Sweet. I'll peek through. Anyway. Okay. Um, okay, so, so that means if you, we have now 10 different teams of the same composition and you can build 12 to give them the same. So, in fact, the total number of distinct sequences, according to this example, is 10, this one, this 10 times that one, so you How, what fraction is this out of all possible sequences? How many possible sequences are there, you think? Can you see that number somewhere? Alphabet size is 4, n is 4. How many possible sequences, DNA, DNA sequences are there if you have length L of DNA? 4 to the power. So, this is, so basically the complexity is this number, 220, calculated here, divided by all possible sequences. Now this goes to the denominator, right? One divided by an L. So this is this that divided by an L. So it means, here you go, in this case it's uh, five sequences, five mole, four different letters per position, possibly. So you divide 120 by four to the power of five. Here you go. The complexity is low, pretty low. The highest complexity would have been one. Possible complexity, so it's fairly low, 10% or so if possible. So Plath would probably say this sequence has low complexity. It has too much of a reduced alphabet. Yeah. You don't want to see this, we mask it, and that's what Plath is. With this combinatorial theory. Now, there is a program made here, and you can run it with all kinds of parameters and give it an input file and it will return the complexity of the sequence you get. Okay. And uh, what is the figure in a very nice metal that the guy basically uh, created this problem using this theory. Okay. Redundancy. What does it mean to be non-redundant? Well basically in the blast speak it means the sequence should be different and one amino acid difference is already enough. Would that be a totally different protein, you think? So people do mutation experiments and they change the amino acid and put that sequence in the database and it's counted as a non-redundant sequence. 
biologically, of course, the sea was having the same fault. It was most probably doing the same thing. So there's a problem with the redundancy definition. And, um, and this could, if you have too many non -redund uh, redundant sequences in the database, you might think that you find a hit and it works a thousand times in a good score, and it's basically looking at the same thing all over again. So that's, uh, that's a risk. Redundancy. Okay, very short sequences. We've seen that already in this famous curve you might remember with blue and orange. You remember that? And uh, so we saw that the score of a short alignment, even if it's if a sequence alignment of 10 amino acids scores 100% or the highest possible, it still doesn't need to mean that they're biologically related because statistics are not powerful enough. And that is when you get a blast of suffering from searching the short sequences. You have to be really careful and it's better to use some of the things. Sequence motif searching is all that will, uh, will be covered in one of the uh, next lectures. Okay, what about very distant sequences, the uh, uh, second, fourth degree cousins and so on, you know. It might have the shape of your nose still, but not the rest anymore, you see. You know, those kinds of things. How do you recognize that? And um, so, basically, what can you do? Do as much as you possibly can. Use different matrices. Use, uh, try and find other still, you know, the alignment is way different, but if there's a region that is well aligned, maybe that is something. Um, you try and use sequences that are hopefully family member of those. Yeah, there's this cog ID that you, uh, uh, you, you compare yourself against the family member, maybe you establish a good relationship there. And you do all the stuff basically, and Marco Pols will be firmly on the agenda, I think, even for the next time, I guess. You do Markov and Hidden Markov, you do the last practical, the largest one will be on that, the Hidden Markov models. You will construct your own Hidden Markov model. And of course, you look for all the, you know, when things are difficult, structural and functional information might really come to the rescue. Very important. Okay, now, this is, you've done all the search, you found this hit. Ah, my career is set. So we look at the annotation. What is the function of the protein? And you see this unannotated sequence as the description. Ooh, that's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, what about a hypothetical protein? This protein sequence might be a protein. Okay. Very often. Or even, you know, more far more to the point, the hypothetical membrane. This might be something with membrane. More we don't know. Good luck with it. Or punitive membrane transport. It's all like it might be something like this, but. Or uh, the like things are nice too. Insulin like. Is it an insulin? This is a real thing, by the way. But uh, you know, sometimes you get like, but it's uh, it is just uh, basically nothing. Or if you, if you like the like, insulin receptor like receptor. Yeah. But but this is one of my favorites. This is a conserved hypothetical. <laughs> this means you have no clue what it does, but. We see many sequences in the database like that. So it's a undefined family, but at least it's a family. Maybe a few, but it's not really that. Ah, now we know. Right? If the talk, uh, tell a good story to this biologist who comes in and who said, I, I'll tell you what this protein will be doing next week. Come back. And they have this. Not good, basically. Okay, this is not a nice one. You run cyclast, and you think I'd like to. Uh, to find something right, so what do you do? As your threshold, you put a bit higher in value, not to be too strict, right? What will happen? The search with the end with global sequence, uh, you have a permissive E value, so maybe global sequence come in, of, co of course, but maybe also an immunoglobulin sequence comes in, or a few, because you, you, you allow your <coughs> sequences. Then that's a hit. The profile will be built with the global sequence. The global sequences and immunoglobulin sequences. Then you have the diluted profile, right? You start searching with this. It wants to go two, two directions, so you get profile wonder. It doesn't know how to walk through the woods anymore. It like to walk in the direction of where the family globin is. But it goes in two directions, perhaps, or somewhere in the middle. And then the kinase says, hey, you come close to me now, you know? So the kinase can see. And you get profile wonder, and in the end, you find the whole database because there is no search image anymore. 
no specificity. So that's uh, so you should not be too permissive. <coughs> what happens if you say now this should not happen? Now I'll make an evil. I put it to zero point oh 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 one, oh, 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 right? What will happen? Sign master will not give you anything anymore. It just stops at your first blast. So but the iteration is not going to give you anything because no scoring will. So you don't use the kind of ability. It's always just making it feel so maybe it's either too permissive or not permissive. Better ask for forgiveness than permission. The British people say sometimes, but here even that is a book. Um, so that's uh, what I just told you, I guess. So here we are, some other combinations of methods that you might try if you have difficult cases at hand. Uh, you know, you do sequence search, you find a couple of sequences, and then really make a multiple sequence alignment using a good program. Then a tree, try to learn from this, how it's family organized, for example. You could do a sequence search, find sequences, get a multiple alignment, but they say, hey, this multiple alignment I use to predict the structure, see what I can find to learn. Uh, or do, oh, this even, you know, this next course, this will be funny. What would you do a project with this? So what you this means you have a sequence, like a structure, and there's another sequence in the database, and of that sequence you have the structure. Now you're using the structural information to see if you can build the structure for your own sequence. That's fun, and you'll do this in the next course. What is it? Modeling. Uh, of course, if you have a multiple line, you can check which columns, as we already have discussed many times, you know, which columns are conserved and which ones are not. See this, Nobel prizes have been given out on this type of questions. Or you try and jump to what might they do functionally from conservation perspective. Okay, uh, we're getting to the end of the lecture. These are known, you know, is this defined? Basically, all are figure, molecular oranges, when you align your sequences, when over 25, say 30% will be saved, of the amino acids are identical to protein sequence alignment. You say, oh, that's the one. Dangerous, but a little bit, but it's as a ballpark figure, it's okay. And that means, under the twilight zone, so from 15 to 25% sequence identity, this is. They call that the twilight zone, and it means, you know, there is a lot of relationships there, of homology, but it becomes a lot harder to find because most methods might start saying, oh, this is not significant for me. Now, then there is the zone under that, called the midnight zone, you're in the darkness. Still, there is a lot of biology to entertain. No way anymore to find it. Just the way see, the statistics don't give you any degree of confidence anymore. If you would have had a structure, you might have seen something. Ah, it's structurally related. Remember, structure more conserved than sequence. And, uh, but this is, uh, this is a hard case, and, and a lot of biology is still here. And what we try and do is be able with next generation technology to get into this area and be able to say more. And the midnight zone will be defined for 10% or even lower. Something that's what we want to interrupt for you to do. Okay, I'm done. Okay, for once. Yeah? Uh, so, hopefully you will recognize me in the last day. Five last of your order, by the way, uh, and all of this stuff. I wish you a nice weekend and a great festival.